will, will notice that the chat function isn't going to everybody. It's actually the chat tonight is just coming to the panelists. So, and I can see that we've just gone live on YouTube as well, which is fantastic. So as you um, probably saw on Facebook tonight is just uh, about primarily hearing from Marama and James, I'll be emceeing. And we've had some questions come in beforehand uh, via all the socials. Um, and we've got those queued up to go. But feel free to, um, as we go through the night, if there's things that you want elaborated or clarified, uh, jump on the chat function and let us know those. And I'll have a speaking order sent to me, and I'll be trying to get through as many of those as possible. But I'm also a stickler for time, so we will be finishing at, um, at 8.30 tonight. So come on in, and as you arrive, just let us know in the chat function where you're from. We're going to give people just a couple of minutes to arrive um, and to get themselves settled. Um, we're two weeks in, um, and I don't know about you, but I'm kind of finding myself settled down a little bit with it, actually. Um, certainly far from anything that I would consider normal, but um, feels like things are settling down a little bit. And um, personally, I've been doing a lot of work, which involves talking at my laptop, like most of you probably have. Um, so I'm not sure I'm getting used to that new normal, but it is great to be able to utilize this at the moment to be able to talk to you all. Um, so, as you can see, we have here with us two lovely co-leaders of our Green Party, uh, James Shaw and, of course, lovely Marama Davidson. Um, we're going to be working through some questions um, over the course of the evening, and I can already see some, some questions dropping into the chat, which is great. So, um, without any further ado, um, welcome everyone again to tonight's virtual town hall, um, and I'm going to ask Marama if you would be so kind as to formally open our hui this evening. Kia ora, thank you very much, Kyle. Kia ora, kia ora koutou, kia ora tātou. Um, me kara kia tātou. Uh, tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho. Kia tau wai, te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumi e, hui e, Take you. Come forth from above, come forth from below, come forth from within and from the environment, vitality and well-being for all, strengthened in unity. And that's a gorgeous karakia that was written by uh, Scotty Morrison, who others may know of uh, TVNZ and Te Karere and a Te Reo, uh, champion. And he generously wrote that in response to COVID-19 for all of us to enjoy. Kia ora, Kyle. Kia ora, tēnā koe, uh, And kia ora, Scotty, for that, um, for that karakia. Um, so welcome again. I can see people coming, still coming in uh, and checking in in the chat, which is great. And we are live on YouTube. Just to say, if you are watching us on YouTube, feel free to put your question uh, in the comments. We've got someone monitoring that, and we will try to get to those questions tonight as well. Um, if you're viewing this uh, on Zoom, as I said, put the question in the chat. And without any further ado, we are going to go across to the first question, uh, which is actually, I've got a question for both of you, actually. And um, this is always a bit more of a loaded question when it comes from a psychotherapist. Marama, how are you doing? Oh, kia ora. I, I appreciate being asked how I'm doing. Thanks, Kyle. I'm doing really well. I'm feeling really grateful. Um, to be uh, in the bubble with my family. Um, it's something I don't normally get to do in my job. Feeling really grateful. Um, feeling very fortunate to have a warm roof and enough kai and enough uh, for us to be taken care of. And finally, I'm feeling a little, um, should I say, anxious or urgent about making sure that everyone else is also okay. But thanks for asking. Sure. James, how are you doing? Uh, well, Kyle, if you're the psychotherapist, maybe you should tell me how I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually, look, I'm, I'm good. Um, it, it, like for everybody else, it's been um, a bit of an adjustment. Uh, we have frenetic lives at Parliament um, and, and kind of doing 12 to 14 hours of back-to-back -back meetings uh, and stuff in the, in the debating chamber and all that kind of jazz. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, now you're talking about 10 hours worth of uh, Zoom meetings and, and so on. But actually, 
um, it has been quite smooth and the kind of, I guess, the machine that supports all of us to do our work is actually, um, is actually operating pretty well. So I think like you open saying that you feel like things are sort of starting to settle into a bit of a new pattern. I think the first week that we were on level four was quite a tough transition for a lot of people. It does feel a little bit like this week um, we're kind of settling into something. Um, but I know that there's still some pretty rough waters ahead for, for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And we are only at half time, as it were, of the four weeks. So um, and, and let me ask both of you, how are you looking after yourselves at the moment um, with all the Zoom meetings and the, and the expectations that are both the same and different? Yeah, yeah sure, James. Uh, probably I'm trying to be very careful about making sure that I'm looking after myself uh, because I know that we should be role modelling for everyone, um, one of the things I need to do and enjoy is I'm and I'm able to, is to get out of my house and go for our little, <laughs> what people are calling our state-sanctioned daily walks. <laughs> um, but I do find that that helps to keep everything in perspective. Um, trying to trying to you know make sure I'm getting enough good cayenne water when I need to, but sleep is the hard one. I have to say, Kyle. Um, I'm finding I could do better with sleep and I hope that this weekend will allow uh, more people to get a bit of a rest but of course our essential workers are going to keep going um, so yeah a, a walk and, and some more sleep some pretty basic stuff there. How about you James? Well Kyle so um, I guess one thing about working from home uh, for a parliamentarian is that this is a much more controlled environment um, and so I am actually eating better than I uh, regularly do, uh, because I have to say at Parliament, you tend to eat what you can when you can. Uh, and, and that's not it's not great uh, for the waistline. Um, and and also I am like my I'm getting out once a day, um, most days. Uh, and, and walking for about an hour up a hill uh, near where I live in Wellington. Um, and that's quite a good workout. And I have to say that after a day of, you know, kind of meetings and looking at a computer screen, that has been fantastic for me. And so uh, some days it's a little tough to go, okay, I'm going to tear myself out of the house. You know, if, you know, you get that sort of closed in feeling in your head. Um, but it, it is magic uh, actually getting out there. So I do recommend that. Yeah, I identify with the food. My eldest and um, my partner have discovered baking every day as an activity, which has its pros and cons. Um, what's yes, the biggest does. challenge with isolation for both of you? What have you been What have you been missing or struggling with with staying at home? Oh well, I um, many people might know I I am fortunate and privileged to be living in a large bubble and have a whole lot of beautiful whānau around me. Um, so we've got, oh, I can hear them now down the hallway. I thought I shut all those doors, people. Um, and so I, uh, the struggle to find the quiet, appropriate places to be on three hour select committee calls has been really interesting. I think I tried a tent uh, that was a bit too noisy. Uh, tried the bed that, that breaks your back. Um, I'm now using bar stools and that uh, as, a, as a desk and that's that's what we're set up on right now. So the challenge of um, working at home, uh, like many, many people, has been really interesting in, um, in a crowded space. Uh, but again, I, you know, it, it would be much harder if I didn't have a warm, dry, safe home. Uh, so that's been a little bit of fun and really interesting. Hmm. James, what about you? What's the biggest challenge for you about being isolated? I think so. Um, it's kind of an odd one uh, because I'm still talking to all the same people I talk to every day. Um, but what I really notice is just the difference in, e even though like Zoom's really good, the you know quality of the tech and so on is amazing these days. And that makes me think about if this had happened 20 years ago, we'd be in a whole lot more trouble. Mm. But there is a qualitative difference between, uh, you know, meeting people over the internet versus in person. Um, and so I, I noticed that that has a, has a sort of a toll in the way that we are able to form consensus and make decisions and things like that. Um, and so 
it's kind of a subtle difference and it took me a, it took me about a week and a half to work out <laughs> quite what it was that I was uh, uncomfortable with um, but that that to me for it just because the nature of our job is is really built around uh, conversations with people on a you know kind of ongoing basis all day every day mm-hmm. um, and and also you know as a minister I've got a staff of about 11 people in, in my office that I'm directly responsible for and a lot of them are having to work from their bedrooms um, and uh, or if they've got young kids um, they're kind of juggling that at home like a lot of New Zealand families right now and so I'm you know I kind of feel for them uh, that they are in the kind of those sort of circumstances because for them actually the ability to go to the office it, it allows them to be able to kind of focus on their job and you know they actually get a level of comfort from that that they that they don't get when they're uh, having to work from home yeah um, kia ora to both of you for those uh, for those answers and, and, and insights, really, into what, what, what it's like for our co-leaders in, in isolation. And just if you're just joining us, um, jump in the chat, uh, fire your questions at us. We want, I can see they're flying in, so we won't be able to get to all of them, but we will answer some of them by email as well if we don't get to them. Um, and just a note, we are live on YouTube too, if people want to jump on there. And we've just been talking about uh, what James and Marlon have been finding. Uh, with isolation and with their families at home. And we're going to jump now to um, to some questions. So uh, isolation brings, um, obviously, the same, similar and different kind of challenges for everyone that we've just been talking about, really. And one of the questions that's been asked is how we measure um, the cost of isolation. And obviously, a lot of people are talking about economic cost, um, which, you know, you could argue is pretty straightforward. But... I guess, how are we going to measure the social costs? And, um, you know, how do we know what those are and are they are they being measured? Kia ora, a really excellent question because I want to start by acknowledging the challenges, the disruption, actually, that, that many, many people are facing, especially if you are facing losing a job or losing your income or reducing your income, but also um, any health effects and any um, other impacts that people are facing. Know that a lot of people, for example, um, aren't able to get to do their shopping as as they should. Uh, People who are elderly or um, more vulnerable to receiving the virus should not be trying to do their shopping. So a lot lot of the ways that we operate have been quite challenging. I wanted to acknowledge those. So the the, the people, the question used the word cost, but I I think about the the wide impacts, the wide impacts of um, COVID-19 and then going into isolation um, have had massive impacts on everyone. And we needed to go into isolation and go hard and go early um, to try and minimize the ongoing costs, the ongoing impacts um, as much as possible. And so we we will have a lot of different measures of what those impacts are. Um, We obviously, for example, we have the amount of people who are applying for the job seekers or who have lost their jobs. We've got the amount of people who have accessed the wage subsidy. Um, we've got all of those, that data and measurement and figures, but we're also going to be uh, looking at the long term, the, the medium term and the long term impacts. And there will be some impacts, perhaps that we're completely unaware of right now, um, with schools, for example, being shut down. What is that going to mean for um, our learning for our children? What is it going to mean for our employment and training? Um, we're obviously going to be keeping an eye on all of those indicators and all of those measurements and we'll continue to do lots of review over months and over years in in fact. Uh, So it's a really good question. Yes, we absolutely will look at all of the impacts, social, environmental, cultural, economic impacts and yes, we will continue to measure those. We don't even know where we're going to end up yet, so we'll have we've still got plenty of work to do um, to suss out how this has affected us on many different levels. Mm. James, would you um, would you like to add anything? 
Um, I think Marima summed it up. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is that it is quite a moving feast. So um, one, one of my jobs is I'm Minister for Statistics uh, and Stats NZ is having to reorganise itself pretty rapidly around um, a lot of the things that Marim is talking about. Uh, you know, what are the things that we measure? Um, what are some of the things where, you, you know, you might not normally think to look, um, but actually there's sort of useful information and data coming through. Um, but the thing about the situation, it is uh, moving so rapidly. And I think, you know, mo most New Zealanders are kind of really conscious every day there's a new piece of news um, that, un that unfolds, that it's going to, that it is going to be a while before we um, get kind of clear measures for, uh, for a lot of what's going on. Mara mentioned the number of people who are accessing, starting to access job seeker benefit. We know that um, something like 1.1 million uh, people are being supported through the wage subsidy scheme uh, at the moment, um, which is, I think, so far the running, running cost, that's about $6.6 .6 billion um, in terms of uh, how much money the government's sort of putting in to keep people attached to their place of work because we'd much rather ev even if they've been furloughed for the moment and are idle because their company is closed down at the moment we're really trying to make sure that people retain that link uh, to that organization so that hopefully um, you know as we kind of move out of um, level four and things start up again um, that those businesses can restart and that those people who are linked to that organization can um, can get back to work. Um, yeah. Um, and of course, the question that's on everyone's mind, um, probably fairly constantly, is uh, how much is longer is the lockdown going to last? When, when, do we, when do we get out? Well, today was hump day. Yeah. yeah. Officially. So um, la la midnight last night marked the end of the second week uh, of the state of emergency out of a total of four weeks. So we are due to finish up, I think on, uh, if I'm not wrong, April the 22nd. 22nd? Yeah. yeah. Um, and having said that, um, I, I know one thing for sure, it won't be any earlier than that, um, but it might be later than that. So uh, we know that we will only make the decision to move out of level four once we're um, really sure that that isn't going to result in a situation where we do have more community transmission and it, the whole thing kind of kicks off again, because that would just wipe out all the gains that we've made over the over the course of the period that we're that we're in the level four alert status. Um, and I think the prime minister said today that uh, there will be an like we, when we are ready to move out, there'll be sort of two days notice. You remember when. We, we went into the state of emergency at level four, there was two days notice to come in. So on the Monday, we went to level three and we said, we'll be at level three for 48 hours. And during that 48 hours, we're gonna take that time to get ready to move out. Now, it's it's actually no simple move to, to actually reverse that process. So one thing is gonna be really clear is that there will be quite detailed communications about what that means for people, what it means for schools, and therefore for parents, um, what it means for um, different types of business or maybe different regions around the country. Uh, and the Prime Minister is intending to publish that next week. Mm -hmm. So we'll all have quite a lot of notice about what it will look like. Um, and then when we get to that point, there'll be 48 hours notice that we're moving and that'll allow us to make that transition as smoothly as we made the transition into uh, the current state. Uh, thank you both, and, and thank you for that um, update, James. Um, Diana, don't forget, uh, although we, we're getting fantastic questions, but keep them coming in the chat, um, and we will try and get to those afterwards if we don't get to all of the questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just post, pop them in the comments where we're keeping an eye on that as well for questions that we can uh, have some time to answer at the end. Um, now, we've got a couple of questions around housing. Um, the first one is why is the mortgage holiday not a mortgage holiday and more of an increase in debt for most people? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really important one. And it's a deferral. And the purpose of the deferral is 
so that people don't lose the house that they're living in right now. We realize that um, people are undergoing quick changes, quick change of circumstances and quick loss of income. And we, we do not want to see people lose their homes. We do not want to see people evicted out of rental properties in the same in the same manner. So the deferral is to help people stay secure and hold on to their home um, because they don't have much income in the short term. It's not compulsory. And I understand that people are being encouraged to still pay if they can, um, because you will still, because it's a deferral, you will still have the debt. Um, it doesn't reduce the debt and you will still incur the interest. So if people are able to pay or pay something, uh, people in banks are encouraging that to happen. But it's, it's merely designed to um, prevent people from losing their homes right now and why we are, while we are in this alert for or isolation period. Yep. And um, so the second question is, uh, the mortgage deferral has obviously been put in place to help landlords. Uh, what's the government doing to help renters? Yeah, and again, we we want everyone, uh, literally literally the health, the, the well-being of our nation and us uh, preventing the spread of COVID relies on us all collectively having a, having a home or somewhere safe to stay home too. So with renters, very similarly, we have frozen increases or we have frozen rents to the level that they are at now. I know that my own friends and family and community were really worried that their income had reduced and they were due for a rent increase. Even a rent increase that has been uh, put up before COVID that was due to happen during this period, even that cannot happen. Uh, because during this time, we have frozen any increases in rent. We've also made sure that, again, no one can be evicted unless in exceptional circumstances, um, and that you have to be in arrears for not paying your rent by at least 60 days. Um, and even then, the tribunal have to agree that it's gotten to the point of eviction. But the, the whole focus and the whole aim is that, well, at all times, even before a pandemic, everyone should be able to have a secure and dignified home to live in. But especially right now, it would just add hardship on top of hardship. Uh, so that's the work that the government has been doing to try and um, protect people who rent, uh, keep people in their homes at this time. Sure, James, anything you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I think Marama covered it uh, fairly well. I mean, the, the, the principle behind the um, mortgage uh, deferral um, is to ensure that owner occupiers can stay in their homes. The point of the um, no evictions legislation and the, you know, the 60 day clause um, and the rent freeze is to ensure that renters can stay in their homes. Because um, we recognize that um, whether you rent or own, you know, you're at risk uh, of losing at least some of your income over the course of the of the coming few months, and we've probably only really just started to see that now. Um, it'll you know there's probably going to be a lot more of that. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the things I would really encourage people who are renting to do um, is to talk to their landlords. You know, we've we've said to um, owner occupiers, talk to your bank. Um, you know, if, if you need to defer payments, you can, but be, as Marama said, be aware that that actually carries its own set of risks. Talking to the banks, we've heard actually that once people have rung up, um, they actually aren't applying for it <laughs> um, and saying, actually, we want to, you know, we'd rather kind of keep making our payments. Um, but if, if, if you're renting, I think it's a good time to talk to, your, to talk to your landlord. And we are starting to get some stories about landlords who are either offering um uh, rent holidays or um, reduced uh, rental rates um, to help their tenants get through this period of time, because we are going. This is going to be widespread, right? We're going to see um, a lot of people affected over the course of the coming few months, uh, and so on. The principle that we're all in this together, and we do really want to encourage people to um, take up that support where uh, where it's been offered. Sure. Well, thanks, James. Uh, th thank you both. Um, <clears throat> Great questions coming through, and it looks like we're going to have heaps of time for questions too, which is great. Um, so keep them coming. 
Um, we're just working our way right through right now through the questions that came through beforehand, and we've got a, a couple more to go. So I'll jump straight to the next one. Um, so we've had questions around COVID-19 and, and uh, the environmental impacts. Um, some of the issues that have come up include uh, Department of Conservation workers unable to continue with pest control um, and recyclable materials, um, for instance, more of that going to landfill because it's unsafe for workers to handle recycling. Um, Manama, what would you say about those issues? Yeah, absolutely. Uh... We, we want long-term and intentional change um, to, to happen in a way that is um, just or to happen in a way that doesn't make it harder for people who are already struggling. Uh, and similarly with our environment, we need to set up our, our structure or our systems in a way that protects our environment um, in a way that, like, for example, we're seeing with the COVID response some with with humans not moving around the world so much and not moving around our own country and less use of cars and dirty cars and less use of planes and ships we're seeing some of the environmental benefits there but we uh what we want is an intentional change rather than um, urgent rapid response change and we want to set those those systems of nurturing our environment in a way that takes us in to the future for good and for protecting nature for generations to come the uh what we've got right now is an opportunity to um defer or to look at those uh, industries and conservation type projects that we can put a lot of our focus and a lot of industries that aren't doing so well. What can we do to focus back onto um, conservation and other type projects here in Aotearoa and our workers and making sure we're training people in the right areas? Those opportunities are now. And uh, with the negative impacts that has been highlighted um, in, in, those, uh, in that question, again, that's another um, impact or cost that was mentioned at the start. And that's why we want to, the, the better that we can do collectively to stop this spread and the, um, the more encouragement we can give each other to stay home and stop the spread, the sooner we will be able to continue uh, protecting our environment and, and getting our trappers back out and getting our hunters back out, getting our water conservers um, and monitorers back out. Uh, so it's in everyone's interest that we um, stop the spread so we continue with the good work, but also, and I think these questions will come later, thinking about what do we actually need to redesign and rebuild um, after this as well. James, thank you, Marama. James, do you want to add anything? What was the question? Uh, it was around the environmental impacts and, and Department of Conservation not being able to trap and, and issues potentially with recyclable materials at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it, look, there. I, I actually keep getting asked about the environmental benefits of the economic shutdown. Um, and as I keep saying, this is not the way that we want to reduce our pollution. Uh, because it comes at the expense of a, an enormous amount of human hardship and it's a very short-term thing. Um, and all it does is pause the effect that uh, humans have on, on the environment. And so uh, the whole strategy that um, we've been pursuing in the time that we've been in government the last two and a half years is to uh, sort of create a separation um, between economic development and pollution and, and to decouple those things. And in my area of climate change, we, um, uh, we know that there's about something like 16 to 20 countries around the world whose economies have kept on ticking, um, but at the same time, they've uh, reduced their greenhouse gas emissions, right? The UK being the most notable example, it um, had, I think it was one of the um, fastest developing economies in the G20, but their emissions fell something like 40% over a 10 year period. And so that shows it can be done. Um, what you don't want is this kind of thing where actually you're just putting hundreds of thousands of people out of work, uh, causing huge, huge amounts of hardship um, uh, for people that we, we know that that is not sustainable either, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, 
you know, whilst people have sort of said, oh, but the air is so much cleaner over China now. Well, yes, that's true, um, but this is not a great way to <laughs> achieve that outcome. Yeah, yeah cheers, James. Um, and thank you both. Um, so that's all the pre-arranged questions that we've uh, sort of taken prior to this event. Um, so I'm gonna ask uh, Rosalie, who's working in the background to um, throw some of the questions at me. Now, if you've just joined us, um, this is a slightly different set up tonight. We've got uh, a panel uh, seminar use of um, the old Zoom, um, and we're also broadcasting live to YouTube. And um, in the interest of participatory democracy and appropriate decision-making, uh, you will get to have your say as we finish tonight about which uh, method you might prefer if you were at the last um, virtual town hall uh, last week. So uh, questions. Now, let me just see here. So uh, the first question, in regards of uh, helping migrants and other overseas people living in Aotearoa who are not eligible for government help, how is that policy law prog progressing and when are people who fall outside citizenship residency going to get some help or support? Yeah, really important. Thank you for that question. This is a priority for the Greens um, and our colleague Golris Gadaman has been quite vocal in wanting to, to work that through. Um, we're of the clear, we're of the clear uh, opinion um, and feeling that everyone needs to be supported, uh, needs to be to supported properly, that it's a basic human decency. And, and more importantly, that there actually is enough. There is enough for all of us to be supported to live decent lives. So that's a that's a piece of work that um, the Greens will continue and have con have been quite strong on before the pandemic. But that's a particular piece of work uh, that we'll be picking up and advocating for in our in our day to day work as well. But I don't know, James, whether you wanted to add to that. Um, so I, I do know that the government is working on it. Um, so I'm on. There's a, um, a cabinet committee of uh, eight mm. uh, ministers who meet daily when cabinet isn't meeting um, to kind of go through the different responses to uh, the COVID crisis. And that's the health response. It's also the economic response and, the, and also the social response. Um, and I know that this is something that uh, we've been sort of getting our teeth into recently. So if people on migrant uh, sorry, people on temporary visas, for example, work visas have had those extended um, so that they don't fall into some kind of weird legal limbo because we happen to have shut the borders and we're not letting people out uh, or move around. But at the same time, you know, so, you know, that they have these sort of visas. So th those have been extended out. Um, and, and it's entirely possible that a number of those people will then re-enter the workforce once the restrictions are lifted, because of course there aren't going to be new people coming in for some time because of the nature of the border restrictions. But we also know that um, under our kind of pre-existing rules um, that uh, they weren't eligible for the same kind of social support. So that is something that I know that um, Kamal Cipollone, who's the minister responsible for social development has been, has been working on. So I hope we'll be able to see something uh, in the next week or so. Thank you both and thank you for that insight. James, into how sort of things are working on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's good to hear. Um, so the next question is, uh, is to you, James, as Minister for Climate Change. Uh, what are your hopes for the coming months in terms of possible transformative change? Well, uh, it's one of my favourite topics. So um, you might have seen some media over the past few days. Uh, a number of people, including myself, have been talking about how um, as if we're going to be investing tens of billions of dollars into um, kind of resuscitating, uh, you know, the economy and jobs and businesses and the work that people do, um, that actually uh, we have to do that in a way that locks us into a low emission pathway. Um, and historically, what's happened is you ha about every 10 years, you have some kind of economic meltdown. And then everybody goes, oh, I just want it to go back to the way it was before. Uh, and so the government pumps all of this money into basically the same old thing that we were doing before. Uh, we actually cannot do that this time. We're out of time. So we know that we've got to at least halve our greenhouse gas emissions by, um, uh, by 2030. Um, and if we just resuscitate the economy so that it keeps on doing what it was doing before, that we won't be able to do that. 
there are amazing opportunities uh, for transport, for housing, for um, uh, for energy, for the nexus of those three things, for our three waters infrastructure, which is falling to bits, um, in agriculture, uh, in conservation, um, which will create employment and build a new generation of um, low emissions uh, infrastructure and housing and so on um, for, for the next generation. And I would say that uh, given that we're currently borrowing tens of billions of dollars off future generations to pay for getting through this crisis, we have a moral imperative uh, to invest that in things that are going to support that generation. Because if we, you know, if we don't reduce our emissions, we are also borrowing off future generations, right? We're actually reducing their uh, kind of living standard. Um, and so I think rather than borrowing off them twice, um, we want to borrow from just, just the once uh, and make sure that the money that we're about to spend um, goes to um, industries and to infrastructure um, that uh, creates a better future for the country. Absolutely. Sure add, I want to add my support to my co-leader. <laughs> um, for, for, those, for those visions, for things that the Greens have been fighting for and working for since the very start of our party, what we can see as an example is um, every country, every community should have access to a strong social safety net. We didn't need a pandemic to tell us that, um, but it's very clear that we need a strong social, social safety net to make sure that everyone is okay. And we should have had that long before the pandemic got here. I'm really pleased and proud of the work that the government is doing now to try and look after as many people as much as we possibly can. I'm, I'm really proud of the efforts that have been made. And what we can see is that having a strong social safety net or having a community and government we're collectively taking care of each other and making sure that everyone is able to live a decent life is, is of the utmost importance. And those are the future, uh, the, well, not the future, those are the, the visions and the policies and the actions that we can actually make change for right now. Um, we can actually make sure that we've got a world that looks after our environment, our climate and our people and understands that those are all interconnected, that our well-being of each other is, inter is connected to our well-being of our planet. And that's a green, you know, that shouldn't surprise anybody that that's a green focus and a green agenda, a green kaupapa, that will continue to be even more important as a result of um, the hardship and what we are seeing now. Uh, yeah, thank you both. Um, if you're just joining us, just jumping on the YouTube uh, live uh, stream or, or joining us on the on the Zoom, uh, we're just working our way through um, audience questions now in this virtual town hall, um, and they're still coming in thick and fast, which is great. Um, now, the next question I have, which I suspect, Marama, you're probably going to want to jump on first, uh, is I understand temporary housing has been provided for the homeless usually seen on Queen Street and presumably in other cities. Is yeah. there anything being put in place for them after the lockdown? Yeah, really good, eh? Because you're right, I just had this conversation today. Oh, I'm on the select committee, the epidemic response select committee, and we meet Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at 10 a.m. And we're having some of those conversations at the moment. Um, it's amazing because when we can see that when we when we need to and when we have to, we can actually make sure everyone is looked after. Uh, what I don't want to see is uh, people not people being kicked out of that emergency housing um, as things start to change. So, and I don't think anyone wants to, in actual fact, <laughs> to be to be quite clear. So yes, uh, I have had people because um, obviously I have to stay home. I can't go to Auckland City. But I've had people in touch with me um, from the council who have confirmed that they've been trying their best to work with all those frontline and community organisations to get everyone as much as they can into a place, off the streets and into a place. And uh, that has been working. And 
every effort uh, and the Greens certainly will continue to ensure that we can keep everyone uh, in a in a safe place as as much as we possibly can, because the um the the stopping the spread of the virus actually depends on it as well. We should do it because it's the right thing to do, but it also turns out that our collective health depends on it. So the government has acquired what they can, including um, including using and acquiring motels at this time, um, and using what we can, what is available. Uh, to try and get people housed. I know that it's also still difficult because um, the social workers for the house, or the, the model that we are using is um, community organizations wrapping around social work support. We actually needed a massive boost and increase of social work support to do this, um, you know, urgently in response to COVID-19. And that will continue. We will need to have that wrap around monarchy and support um, for everyone uh, who needs it to keep people housed as much as possible as well. So it's not just finding people a place to live. Um, we've also had to increase massively the amount, uh, the social support around that as well. Thank you, Mama. James, did you have anything to add? Yeah, so, um, I mean, even before the crisis hit, we were building um, more public houses um, than, uh, any government in the last 30 years. So that's taken a while to ramp up, um, but I think that that will be one of the areas where our government invests in most heavily uh, over the course of the coming months and years. Um, and so that, you know, as Manama said, once um, people have kind of got, gotten through emergency housing, there should be uh, some state housing available there. Um, I, I also know that uh, the nature of the crisis is actually causing quite a big reorganization uh, in the rental market as well. So, for example, all of those houses that were tied up as Airbnbs, a lot of them are coming back into the rental market, um, and that should have the effect of um, creating more supply in the, in the private rental market um, and also probably lowering rents a bit. Um, and that should ease a bit of pressure, which means more places uh, for um, kaying order uh, to find for people who find themselves in, in an emergency housing situation. Um, so a combination of continuing the public build program or actually expanding the public build program um, and taking advantage of the fact that the, that the market's been reorganized anyway, basically because tourism's fallen off a cliff, um, uh, I think will, will change, change circumstances. I know um, we've been working quite closely with Megan Woods, who's the Minister for Housing, uh, and she has a that she and her officials uh, at um, uh, Housing and Urban Development and Kainga Order have been um, working extremely hard over the past couple of weeks uh, to develop a, a response. And I think that you'll see that, I mean, you've got the kind of emergency response through things like the rent freeze and all of that kind of stuff that we put in place. But there, there's kind of more of that to roll out over the coming, coming weeks and months. I um, wanted to pick up, I. I've got my chat closed, but I see some of the top comments, uh, some of the front comments come through. I think it was Alec talking about um, how we see housing. And you're absolutely right. And what the Greens will, will keep working with the government with is that housing needs to be seen as homes for people to live in and not just ways for already wealthy people to build even more wealth. And that's the move to the public housing that James is um, absolutely talking about there. This is, I think, I'm hoping, and with the support of people, um, we will see more and more emphasis on housing as a core public good. Um, housing is a fundamental human right uh, and really focus our efforts onto public and community housing. I'm sure we all can support that, Marama. Well said. Um, the next question, um, the and I'll just flag, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we've got time for a few more questions um, before we move to, to wrapping up um, for, for a hui this evening. Um, but the next question, the current pandemic impacts show the fragility of global supply chains. Given how reliant we are on imported food staples and the use of fossil fuels to get them here, do you have any plans to relocalize our food system and propose a food sovereignty initiative for New Zealand? Well, I, I think that's actually sort of starting to happen by itself. So um, New Zealand uh, produces 
the equivalent food for about 40 million people. And of course, there are 5 million people in, in the country. Uh, and I do know that um, a lot of our, our kind of farmers and the um, intermediary organizations and supermarkets and so on have been um, kind of working quite uh, rapidly to make sure that um, New Zealanders have access to um, all the different types of food groups that you would um, hope and expect. And so far, that seems to be uh, that seems to be working pretty well. Um, so I, I think the the area where I've got greatest concern actually isn't in the domain of food, um, but actually in the domain of manufactured goods. Um, so one of the things that the last couple of months has shown is that when you have a global pandemic. Every single country in the world wants access to ventilators, to um, uh, um, you know medicines, uh, to personal protective equipment, to face masks, uh, rubber gloves, you know you name it. Um, and actually, uh, that can be hard to come by when every country in the world is asking for uh, you know a lot of that um, at exactly the same time. Now we've been quite lucky uh, in in New Zealand, and and that there are some still local manufacturers who are quite quickly gearing up uh, to produce um, at least some categories of personal protective equipment, um, and and so we're starting to see more and more of that uh, become available. Um, but it just it does show that having manufacturing uh, capacity in New Zealand that can be reorganised very quickly when you need it around a, a crisis like this is actually a really important capacity to have. Um, and so I, I do think that uh, one of the things that we will be thinking of as we think about how, how to invest in uh, rebuilding the economy and what industries to uh, support and so on, we will be thinking about um, you know, some of those kind of critical supplies and to ensure that we actually repatriate some of our own manufacturing capacity into, uh, into New Zealand. Yeah, I think I think surely now is is a time even more than ever where we can think about um, our local production and I think the term that is used is normally add value or, or higher value stuff. But like flour keeps running out of the supermarket. It's actually not toilet paper in my supermarket, at least it's flour. So I've been wondering about wheat and <laughs> can we grow even more can we and and will we finally get a focus on why it's so important to protect our waterways and our soil health um, so that we can grow high quality food and more of the local uh, ingredients food that we need for some of those staples that we all eat as well i think now's the time for us to get our ideas together and start thinking about um, initiatives and projects that really will restore and protect those key elements of life, eh? So that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, next question is from Mike in Invercargill. Hi, Mike. Um, I'm one of many that rely on daily care from my very loyal care team because of cerebral palsy. We've been told both by Prime Minister Arjun plus the Director General of Health that we will all have PPE supplied, but as yet no one in Invercargill has any um, as of today. Why and where is it all? Care has come into our bubble daily, putting us all at risk of COVID-19. Plus, we are the most vulnerable as we have compromised health. Thank you, Mike. Uh, really important that you've raised this because, again, I'm on the select committee and have been asked, we've been asking this directly to Dr. Bloomfield himself. Uh, and we've been constantly, we've been told that um, this, is, this is being sorted but that we do want to know um, when it's not sorted. And I do also understand that there's a different relationship with carers and in-home carers. Um, we shouldn't be expecting carers who are for far too long have been undervalued and underpaid as it is um, to have to then try and sort out and provide their own uh, PPE or protective equipment. So I'd really want to have a, a, a closer look at that. But James, I don't know whether you know anything further yeah, well, so what we know is that, is that there, there have been some distribution problems. Um, and uh, part of the issue that we've got with the DHBs is that um, often the DHBs don't use the same system. So they've actually got their own systems. And so in some cases, we haven't been able to get a nationwide picture of, of how the whole thing knits together. Um, so 
there have been kind of weaknesses in that model that have that have shown up as a result of uh, the activities over the course of the last few weeks. I think um, with your specific case, uh, what you should do is email us, um, mm -hmm. and um, you know we'll try and uh, get to the bottom of that for you, whether that's through Southland DHB or uh, through Ministry of Health or, or, or other means. Um, and I would say that to anybody who's on the call, because I know, you know, government, don't, you know, we deal with these kind of big programs for, you know, workers or unemployed people or, you know, people who need housing assistance or whatever, but there's always someone who uh, kind of, even though technically they fit into that category of being in support, for some reason, the system isn't kind of responding. Um, and so that's where the work of your MPs uh, doing that sort of um, uh, kind of connecting the dots comes in useful. So um, please do uh, send us a note and we'll do our best to try and clear that up for you. Absolutely. I I hope that I just put my email into the chat there, my email address into the chat for people, hopefully. I think you did. did I think I... that's exactly what you did. Yay. So that's... please please do because, um, no, we don't want that happening and, and we can try and sort that out. Thank you, Marama. And um, it's marama.davidson at parliament.govt.nz. Oh, yes. Any trouble accessing the chat, uh, or maybe if you're watching on YouTube. But send, you. send those examples in, and we can get our, we can get our co-leaders working for us, which would be great. Um, so next question, and it may very well be the last, depending on how quick you are with your answers. So we'll see how we go. Um, the supermarkets have a monopoly, and market gardeners are going out of business. They are often run by immigrants who do not always have the same know-how for subsidies, uh, et cetera. Can we please have these considered as essential services? Yeah, look, so I'm, I, as a, it's a really difficult one. Um, and there are, it's not just market gardeners. There's a lot of, you know, um, kind of high street stores and, and other, um, you know, very small businesses that supply uh, food. The principle that we're operating to here is one of uh, essentially a, a medical prerog um, necessity, which is we're trying to minimize the points of contact between people in order to break the chains of transmission. transmission. Um, and so the, uh, the supermarkets are, are places which um, essentially our uh, um, Ministry of Health officials and um, Ministry of Primary Industry peoples can work with because you've got concentrations of in the distribution centres and, and in the supermarkets to make sure that they are doing all of the things that um, are necessary in order to make sure that as they're handling food and goods and services that they are not um, accidentally transmitting the virus. Um, and so the issue that we've got is that we need to control to as few as possible the numbers of points uh, where, um, uh, you know, retail essentially interacts with the public. Um, and so that's why we've had to restrict that. Um, it is really unfortunate. Um, you know, it is unfortunate for market gardeners, for your kind of corner baker or your, um, or your butcher in most cases um, have had to stay closed. We did keep dairies open, um, and that's because that's only because there are some people who have accessibility issues and just can't get to a supermarket, um, can't order online for some reason, um, and we felt that we needed to have at least some way of those people accessing food within walking distance. But even then, they're under very tight restrictions, so um, it's not a great situation. Um, and and the really the the trick to it is to make sure that we do actually uh, eradicate the virus inside New Zealand, and then we can reopen the market gardens and, and others. Thank you, James. Um, difficult decisions, difficult decisions to make, I imagine, about those essential businesses. Um, I am going to ask one quick question, and I'm going to uh, require a quick answer, because I'm sure the answer might probably be, I don't know, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it anyway. What's the likelihood the election is going to be delayed? Oh, I, I keep I keep saying nothing's off the table because that's what <laughs> Grant say, uh, and and simply it's all going to depend on how we stop the spread and whether we keep stopping the spread. Because uh, what I wanted to add to James James's um, quoted all at the start is depending on our behaviour um, 
we could go out of alert level four, but back to three, but then back to four. So it's all going to depend on how well we do. We're doing great, by the way. We're actually decreasing overall now. We're having more people recovering than new tests confirmed. And again, that happened today. We're doing amazing. Um, so we, we just don't know too much into the future right now. And, and anything's possible with election, actually. So the, um, the date of the election is the prerogative of the Prime Minister, and she announced back in late January that it would be on the 19th of September. Um, our view is that that should only change if the Electoral Commission comes to a view that actually it's just not democratically viable to hold it on that date. Um, and so uh, if, if, they did, if they did come to that view and, and they recommended that we move the date of the election, um, then the Green Party would support that um, because you know, that would be an independent expert view from the Electoral Commission. Um, but we don't think that um, political parties jumping in and saying, we think it should move to X, Y, or Z date uh, is terribly helpful. Um, so uh, it is up to the Prime Minister, um, and, I, and I'm sure that she will take the advice of the Electoral Commission into, into account. Um, but at the moment, uh, they have said that they are confident that it can be delivered um, properly and fully on the 19th of September. Um, Kyle, I'm gonna I'm gonna be an annoying interrupter. Sorry, I keep seeing some uh, front comments down on my bottom little chat thing about donut economics, and I know James. Oh, yeah. I think James should have a chat as well. And people asking, do the Greens back this? The Greens were pushing this before it was even a concept. And Jeanette Fitzsimons, our dear first female co-leader, just departed recently. She was calling on better indicators beyond GDP that um, understood that we needed to have indicators for our whole health of our environment, our people and our climate, I think 20 decades ago. This has been a priority for the Greens for a long time and it's what James spends a lot of his days and nights working on. So I know you'd like to add something on that. Well, just, I mean, yeah, so we, I mean, we actually bought Kate Rowe with, uh, to um, uh, Wellington a while ago to, to do some workshops and seminars and, and to try and help to get that model sort of uh, more um, popularized. Uh, and actually it was quite gratifying just how receptive um, people were to that, which I do think shows that the work done over the last 20 years or 30 years or longer uh, has, has actually taken root. And I do think, uh, and I'm feeling pretty confident that as the government starts to plan how we shape the response to COVID-19 and, and the recovery program, um, that the principles that Kate Raworth is talking about in donor economics will be present in that, in that program. Thank you both. And not an annoying interrupter, I think that's called co-leaders probably. So <laughs> glad you jumped in because it was popping up a lot and it's been in the news today, of course, um, as well. So um, thank you for that. Um, so we are going to wrap up now. Um, so firstly, let me just say thank you to all um, our virtual town hall attendees and yes. YouTube viewers. Thanks for, for coming along this evening. Um, we have used a different approach for Zoom tonight. Um, it hopefully um, has been a good viewing experience for you, but we will be, um, in, in the spirit of appropriate decision making, popping a poll up and we'd love you to let us know which you preferred um, if you attended both town halls. That will help us moving forward plan which method we use. Um, and um, if you feel like doing something positive after leaving the meeting tonight, um, we're also going to pop a graphic up, I think, in the comments, Rosalie, if I understand it correctly, uh, which is a graphic from the Green Party sharing thank you for all our wonderful essential workers, um, not just doctors, although thank you doctors, but also <laughs> all, the, all the essential workers who are keeping everything that we need for the basics of life open right now um, and are doing that bravely and you know with courage in their heart and generosity for all of us so if you want to share that on the socials that would be wonderful um that's it from me thank you all for coming i'm going to hand over to marama to close our hui for us this evening kia ora everybody um really enjoyed our kōrero tonight uh me karakia tātou kia hora te marino kia whakapapa paunamu uh, te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou e tātou katoa. 
May peace be widespread, may the sea be like greenstone, a pathway for us all this day. Give love, receive love, let us show respect for each other. Kia ora tato. thank you very much. <laughs>